What is up, wrestling fans? Welcome to another pay-per-view point edition of the Smart Guy Moments Smack Talk Podcast. I am your host, as always, Tony Mango, and joining me, as always, are Callum Wiggins. Hello. And Robert D. Felice. Hello. This is part one of our two-part pay-per-view point coverage for this week. We are on the predictions of NXT TakeOver War Games 2019. Uh, this is being recorded before NXT happens later on tonight. So we are still kind of a little bit in the dark about some information, and that's going to potentially change our opinions about some different things. But we're going to address anyth- uh, anything that does change on tomorrow's recording, which is going to be the Survivor Series talk. And, of course, that like the stuff that we don't know the most is stuff that applies to Survivor Series, so that's why we're taking uh, this advantage uh, to do this while we can. But... We're going to run down the TakeOver card as far as what it currently is, give our projections and our predictions, and do the rundown that we normally do here. So you should know the score by now, you should know how this works, but if you don't, and you are listening to the audio-only platforms like the iTunes or Stitcher or Google Play or Spotify feeds, then head on over to the YouTube channel, ring the bell for the notifications, subscribe if you haven't done it already, like the video, and drop a comment below and tell us what your predictions and your thoughts on our predictions are as well. We're going to run down some other plugs later on, we're going to talk about lots of different things here, so let's just get the ball rolling right now with uh, some speculation. We only have four matches right now on the card, although one of them they were very hesitant to actually put on the card. It was really uh, kind of annoying. Uh, First things first, do you think that there's going to be a fifth match? I'm of the opinion that it's not going to happen because of the past two war games only having four. No, I think what we have now is what we're going to get. I think we might get a fifth one just because it's a typical pattern that they follow. But I wouldn't. It, it wouldn't shock me if they just stuck with these four. Well, we almost didn't even get a fourth because they are all over the place here. And this is a typical situation with WWE where their wires just keep getting crossed, and they have all this time and all these uh, people working for the company and all this manpower and all this money where they can avoid anything like this. Yet they always do it where. The WWE website does not have information that reflects some things that you should know well in advance. I mean, realistically speaking, and I'm not even just patting myself on the back here, Smart Out Moment is always more up to date than WWE.com. And that's ridiculous. But one of the confusing things that they had done, outside of the fact that they don't have the proper graphics for certain things and, uh, you know, different things about, like, uh, matches being announced well after the point that they really should have and all that. Uh, They had this triple threat match between Killian Dame, Pete Dunne, and Damian Priest. I had written that down two weeks ago or so. As soon as they started all fighting, I was like, all right, that's probably going to be the fourth match. And then they decided that they were going to announce that it was going to happen on NXT. And at first, it was supposed to be that the winner now suddenly gets a title shot on Friday Night SmackDown against Adam Cole. Then that changed, and it ended up being, no, 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 they're not getting a title match on SmackDown. They're wrestling on Wednesday to get a title match on Survivor Series. And then it became, nah, they're actually doing this at TakeOver. I hate when this kind of crap happens because it's all over the place and it drives me crazy, but at least they went with the right decision here. So... Right now, we have a triple threat number one contenders match. Dane versus Don versus Priest. The winner fights Adam Cole at Survivor Series. That kind of spoils who wins because it's pretty much got to be Pete Dunn, right? Not ne- I mean, it, Pete Dunn is definitely the heavy favorite, I'd say, but it's not necessarily foregone conclusion, especially because the match at Survivor Series feels like a foregone conclusion because it's probably likely that Adam Cole will retain whoever he faces. So it's an opportunity to just give a spotlight to whoever they want to present as somebody that could challenge for the world championship or win the world championship in the near future. I Dunn can't against, see. Go ahead. Well, as I was say, Dunn versus Cole offers the most intriguing matchup, or at least the one that will be the best quality. Uh, yeah, I can't see it being anybody else but 
Pete Dunn. Damian Priest is good, but he's not at that level yet. And Killian Dane would almost make no sense. But I can see Pete Dunn and Adam Cole having the best match at Survivor Series. So I'm all for it. I think Pete Dunn wins. Yeah, I can't imagine a scenario where Killian Dane is up against Adam Cole and filling that Survivor Series thing. It's just like, why is that a heel against that? Even more so, Damian Priest, he's not making like the same impact. And he's, you know, he's doing okay. Like, it's a developmental territory still. But he's not like some, oh man, they gotta put this, uh, put him on the card type of guy. Whereas Pete Dunn, he's a babyface. He's been the longest reigning United Kingdom champion, the longest reigning champion in general for pretty much almost anything. And he wrestles well with Adam Cole. They're roughly the same size, so there's no discrepancy with that. It gets a bigger name on the card. It has to be Pete Dunn that wins this. And for that matter, jumping ahead to tomorrow with Survivor Series, Pete Dunn's going to lose. Adam Cole's going to retain. But I do think that this match is going to be more fun now that they have the triple threat thing instead of just Pete Dunne versus uh, Killian Dane, which is how I originally thought they were just going to go. I thought that Priest was going to be like a a mid-range, middle ground type of guy for the feud. But it's probably... No, it's not that it's probably. It is my um, lowest ranked match on this card. You guys agree? Yeah, it's the one that has the... doesn't have a... Well, it has obviously has a stipulation attached to it, but it doesn't have a gimmick associated with it, and it's not Matt Riddle against Finn Balor, so it's kind yeah. of by default. It's not saying the match itself is going to be bad. I think it will be pretty good, and maybe a nice change of pace from the other matches because obviously we're going to get two War Games matches, which although we'll, I assume will have very subtle variations, are still pretty much the same match in their concept. And Matt Riddle versus Finn Balor is going to be great, but this is going to be something a little bit different. Although by the time we watched it we might especially with Survivor Series coming up we might get our fill of triple threat matches for the rest of the year based on yeah. on this weekend yeah. alone and for a little bit into next year as well um I agree but that being said if they add like the Forgotten Sons to the card then this match is instantly not the worst match on the card it's just one of those things where it's only the lowest match because of where it's positioned and how well if we do get a fifth match what do you think that would it be because i can't think of any feuds going on right now that would be worth it it would have to be something that's just either put on there for the sake of putting it on there or they do some kind of a quick angle tonight on nxt and even in that regard it is kind of just sort of happening to happen like whether it's leo rush against his like ninth contender since he won that title or the forgotten sons doing something or you know I think, Have they done the Forgotten Sons against Brizango yet? Yeah. yeah, they've done that on TV. I think they okay. did it twice, actually. All Not right, that it would well. matter anyway. But I think if I was to bet on a fifth match, it would be Leo Rush against Daniel Garza. I because would... they they seem to be wanting to continue that feud as like being a big rivalry over the title. As their previous match wasn't exactly like super conclusive. and Angel Girls have showed uh, Leo Rush disrespect after the match, so I think they're going to fight again, but I don't know whether it'll be on this card or not. I would bet on that one, too. I would also just throw out Walter and Kushida. If they Kushida's really... injured, isn't he, as well? Isn't he due to come back tonight or something? Uh, I don't know if they've... Potentially. Uh, but that, they've already done the singles match and Walter won that, so I, I wouldn't I would be surprised if they decided to give Kushida a title match off the back of that. Maybe the one thing they could potentially do is in the preparation for Survivor Series, they could say that, okay, so we've chosen like these four people to be Team NXT and then we've got a battle royal on NXT, on uh, TakeOver and the winner gets the fifth spot spot on the uh, the team. And that's way, how you can get Walter or someone like that onto the team. That'd be a good way to do it. It would be interesting if they did put something with the NXT UK side of things other than Kaylee Ray on this card. But then again, the NXT UK stuff doesn't air on the USA Network. 
So it's almost more so their supplemental for the Wednesday Night USA crew rather than that they're actually like something to focus on. And let's be honest, NXT UK is like 205 Live. Nobody cares. Those two brands and the main event show are the three that WWE are just sort of like, yeah, it's okay if nobody watches them. They don't ever really like advertise them all that much. It's okay if you don't know who Kaylee Ray is, even though she's a champion and she should be a big deal and all that other kind of stuff. So I don't anticipate anything coming for a fifth match. And I also don't anticipate something like an NXT UK feud to be put on there, especially since they didn't announce anything like last week. They could tomorrow on the NXT UK show say something like, uh, I don't know, Piper Niven is going to wrestle um, Jazzy Gabbert and just be like, we'll put that on like a pre-show of NXT or something like that. As far as I know, they don't have they haven't said anything about like when the pre-show time is for this yet, too, have they? Because it's not as okay. standardized as WWE. Uh, let me check real quick because I think they did confirm something. WWE I mean, pretty from the- much always puts it like it's an hour beforehand, or if it's a big four event, it's two hours beforehand. Whereas NXT think- sometimes it's a half an hour, sometimes it's an hour. Like, I think fundamentally, if you don't know, and you're probably the only person in the world that cares about that then it's unlikely they would have revealed it. <laughs> Probably, yeah. I always um, want to make sure that I know ahead of time for, like, to not miss a single thing, because, you know, it's my job, and I care. I'm like WWE sometimes. Yeah, I'll get back to you on that, but I do think they did announce something. Yeah, well, that'll be one of the instances where it's like, oh, maybe the website's not as up-to-date as the other things, but I'm looking on their stuff right now, and I don't... I don't see anything that really indicates exactly when that's supposed to happen. When well, team typically never does anything on a pre-show, because so I just hype up the matches anyway. Yeah, although this is the first event that they're doing since coming to uh, USA. So they could change it up. I don't think they'd feel like compelled to do it because it's a WWE Network show. It's not. It's not. It's it's not going to have any sort of crossover really with the USA Network side of things. Probably. Yeah, I just I just don't think that they might have gotten like, a few more eyes onto the product than they would have done through um well certainly would have gotten more eyes on the product than they would have done through WWE Network, but I don't know if anything they've been doing has been compelling people to all the network that didn't have it already. The only information I seem to be coming across right now is potentially six o'clock start time with the pre show. But then again, who knows? I'm also um, looking at a website that spelled the WWE Network with an F. So... <laughs> like the WWF Network or just like real bad? WWE Neck Waft. Cool. All right. So the pre show will be at 6 30. And I guess the show begins at 7. Yeah. So that's just a run down the card type thing. Yeah. And then, of course, the night after Survivor Series is. Two hours because they hate us. <laughs> uh, well, we'll see what that ends up doing. Um, let's go talk about one of the other matches that was supposed to be something different. And then they ran into an issue where Johnny Gargano was injured. So they decided, let's just pivot and do this instead, which is Finn Balor versus Matt Riddle. It's very obvious that Matt Riddle was supposed to be that uh, missing member of the War Games match, not only because he was originally announced for it, but the graphics that they have on the Twitter page has him as a part of that, and Finn Balor just in the middle of everybody. Over, yeah, he's overlooking everybody. Yeah, so, it's pretty obvious. Yeah, and that's a disappointment, and that's credit where it's due. That's not something that WWE had planned. You know, they obviously wanted Johnny Gargano to not be injured i don't feel like they handled this the best way though and i don't know really exactly what i would have done different than that but i feel like this was one of those lazy things where they were like what do we do i don't know uh, riddle and balor and let's just the two of them fight a little bit and then we announce it and it's kind of like all right well that's that's lazy and i'm not as excited for it i don't think that's going to be as good as what balor and gargano would have been I think it's one of those circumstances where 
they were promising the fans something and then because they couldn't deliver, they gave them the next best possible thing. I think out of the possible choices of... It's always Chomp has to be in the War Games match because it's likely he'll be the next big challenger for Adam Cole's title. And I think out of the options of Keith Lee, Dominic Dijakovic and Matt Riddle, Matt Riddle offers the best possible matchup with Finn Balor. So it's not like they could have really chosen anybody else for this position. And Balor needs to have a match on this card because he hasn't had a match since coming back to NXT. Well, I want to uh, preface this with the idea that we don't know exactly what this whole thing is, but we're going to come back to this a couple different times. Triple H on a media call had said that they're not going to announce every member of Team NXT and that there is supposed to be some sort of epic surprise. No, that's not what he said. Wasn't that what it was? They're, they're not going to announce every member of Team Champa. The epic surprise is Saturday night for Champa, not for Survivor Series. Oh, that's what it was. I thought it was the, the Team Survivor Series. Yeah, it's for Champa's team, not the Survivor Series team. Huh. Okay. Well, then that changes it around a little bit, but that also still kind of comes back to the same point that I was going to go with. And in either fashion, I was going to say here, we have to figure out who that epic surprise could be. And depending on who it ends up being, I kind of feel like maybe what could have been a better option here is that that quote unquote epic surprise should have been the one fighting Balor. And the way that they've been doing things here is the Undisputed Era has been, I mean, there's the four of them. They've been fighting things like, you know, the four of them against Ciampa, the four of them against Ciampa, Lee, and Riddle, the four of them against Ciampa, Lee, and Riddle, and Gargano. The, the Dominic Dijakovic just sort of comes into the mix and he has nothing to do with any of it. He's just there because we need him. But Balor's been a part of this too. And they haven't fully made, I would have personally said, Let's just do five on five war games. But if they needed to have Balor on his own, then I kind of feel like if he's the outsider to the Undisputed Era, this quote unquote epic surprise should have been the outsider to that original quartet. But if you were to have this this big surprise coming in, would you have them lose straight out against Tim Balor? Because Balor has to win this match. It depends on who the person is. That's where the confusion comes in. Because I'll say it right now, I think that it's John Morrison. For War Games? Yeah. Is that no make-believe? You actually believe? <laughs> no, <I'm laughs> who, well, who are the other options? Velveteen Dream, who has a back injury and a recent report said he's probably not due until at least January. Kushida. Yeah, 2020's probably, yeah. Kushida's got a rest injury. He has nothing to do with this match at all. And if that's their big idea of an epic surprise, then that's really going to be disappointing. Yeah, like, it's, I mean, it's... Kushida's fine, but if they're like, oh my god, you guys, this is going to be epic. And then it's like, it's Kushida's return. Oh my god, everybody clap. Everybody will be like, really? That's fucking it? It's not CM Punk or something? Like, you know, there is yeah. the idea of CM Punk. I don't think that that's the case. Some people are throwing out Shawn Michaels. I don't think that that's happening. Whoa. I would laugh at the idea of Sam Punk going, I'm not going to wrestle. Okay, I'm wrestling and I'm going to do it in a fairly dangerous match. <laughs> uh, I think it's got to be Velveteen Dream. There's there's legit, literally no evidence that he's healthy to compete. I just don't see any other option making sense unless you pull in like an AJ Styles. Well, that's and... what I think. I think they'll pull in a ringer that's only going to be a one-night deal. Not, I don't think it'll be someone on the... The only person I can see it being on the main roster is Kevin Owens. And he has fun. no real reason to be a part of that? No. Because he got attacked, you know? Well, yeah, but that, would be that might lead into some like predictions for Survivor Series, but I'll discuss that like tomorrow, but they're, I, I just don't think that if, the, if they're building up as a big epic surprise, and NXT isn't like the main roster in like promoting a really, really big deal and then not delivering on it. So it must be someone who is either returning or hasn't been around for a while or is seen as like a big superstar appearing in this match to team up with Jumper rather than 
like a Kushida or a Cameron Grimes or a Swerve Scott or something like that. So we know that there are certain people that we can roll out. We can roll out anybody who's on team anything on NXT, uh, on Raw or SmackDown for the most part, because why would they be wrestling on War Games as a part of NXT and then go like, ah, oh, fuck you, NXT? Like, that doesn't make any sense. So rule out, like, obviously you rule out, like, AJ Styles or uh, Drew McIntyre or any of those people, but maybe... There's people that are on those two rosters that can move over and be a part of NXT that aren't doing anything on those rosters. And I'm looking at the list right now, and it's like, all right, it's not going to be Aleister Black. He's clearly setting up something with Buddy Murphy. It's not going to be like Andrade stepping in and doing that. The only name that I'm coming across right now that I feel it doesn't really apply is being like epic. But maybe they would constitute it as that is Cesaro. Does have an NXT lineage behind him. He is really not doing all that much on uh, SmackDown. For some reason, they had him like as part of the Sami Zayn Nakamura crew, yet they already said like that that's not really happening. No. That would have been like well, a no, better he, direction, I think. They referenced him when Sami was on SmackDown, like, hey, Cesaro wants you to join us. So it seems like they still might do that. On this past week? I thought it was only like yeah. two, two weeks ago or three weeks ago. When they had them. No, it was on this past week. I know he only had Nakamura, Nakamura. with him, but he mentioned oh, okay. Cesaro on three of those. I must have missed that. I feel like they might have dropped that entire thing just because they decided to pivot away from Daniel Bryan challenging for the Intercontinental title. Yeah, yeah, they moved it over to uh, Strowman. But I don't see... I don't see anyone on the main roster making sense unless it's like a... Like you said, like a Kevin Owens who could easily jump back in to NXT and fit the mold. But I don't know. I don't see anybody the other, viable. The only other potential one would be if Samoa Joe is fit and is healthy again after his broken thumb. Maybe he could be drafted in. I really enjoyed him on commentary. If he's going to be out for a while, I'm okay with him just sitting behind the booth. I, it's going to be a hard one to predict. Yeah, it, I mean, it has to be someone, if it's someone on the main roster, it, had to be, it would have to be someone who does have ties to NXT in some form or fashion. Like, you're not going to have The Miz come down and be the fourth member of the team. Yeah. But You think Rollins? No, well, it can't be, because he's fighting. It won't be, it, no, and it, it, it shouldn't be Reigns either. And it can't be even like, you know, hey, Lars Sullivan's back, because that's not going to be quote-unquote epic. And it won't go down well, I don't imagine, either. Which, by the way, uh, very random side note, but we were just talking about the whole Brian and Nakamura thing. I think that they're going to go right back to that, and that's going to be like, Brian is going to be Intercontinental Champion going into WrestleMania. I'm going to actually say no, and I think Brian gets his Nakamura match at WrestleMania. Maybe. I don't know. But maybe EC3. Uh, I know that doesn't sound like yeah. super epic, but yeah. maybe if he, yeah. if he's coming back to NXT permanently, then they, they could try and dress it up like that. I mean, at least it's not Conor Reeves. <laughs> uh, he's fairly pushed over to the NXT UK side of things. And he's getting smashed by yeah, massive uh, people. As he should. As he should. I'm a big fan of EC3. Uh... Not a big fan of the carrier jet that's in uh, Rob's <laughs> location. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Uh, and it's, it's, it's the guy that's flying in for the uh, NXT War Game show to be on Team Jump. Yeah, it's uh, the, the epic surprise. Rob's doing it. He's already on the plane. Yeah. His man. name's Jet yeah. String. <laughs> <laughs> but it's Jet with two T's, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, T String. <laughs> that's J A E double T. S T. It doesn't quite work the same. Yeah. Uh, I, that's, I'm a big fan of EC3. I don't think that that would be considered epic. I'm a big fan of Cesaro. I don't think that that would be considered epic either, but I think that, that would be more so in line with what they would consider a quote-unquote epic thing. I can't imagine it being CM Punk. As much no. as it is like that he digs NXT and that's that would fit with something and all that, if CM Punk were to come back, and he might not, if he comes back, he's going to come back on like SmackDown or something. They'll I mean, pay it, for it to be like Fox. 
I mean, he he likes NXT, but do you really think the first foray he'd come back into wrestling would be on the brand that Triple H runs? Unlikely, I'd imagine. Yeah. Do you think he's more comfortable working for Vince than for Hunter? It would seem that Hunter was the one that he had the like major problems with coming out of it as opposed to I mean he had problems with the company in general, but it seemed like he was targeting him a bit more than Vince with the you know in the enough. final falling out. I think there's issues all over the place and I I don't think that I think I'd like to believe that Punk is being genuine when he says that he's not ready to kind of cross that bridge yet. And then but it does kind of strike me as the sort of thing that he would do to just build that sort of idea in your head that oh it can't be CM Punk and then oh my god it's CM Punk but yeah I, I don't he, ha- he has Punk. that in his nature I think it's Morrison do we know that he signed because it, it seems to just completely disappear about him being part of the company we don't know for a hundred percent fact but everybody seems to just talk about it as if it's something that they've been sitting on and if this was like the game plan as being well see that's the other thing too if this was the game plan of being like, well, we're just going to wait and we're going to bring you in at War Games, then Riddle wouldn't have been a part of the team. And I suppose that maybe Dijakovic wasn't supposed to be part of the team because they didn't allude to that at all. And maybe he wasn't supposed to be a part of it. And maybe that was the the game plan was going to be uh, Champa, Lee, and Riddle and a blank name. And then Gargano against uh, Balor. And they still could have done that. And it just would have been Dijakovic wouldn't have been a part. And then, ah, crap, right? We got to move Riddle out of there. So who what do we do? Well, we can't have two against uh, four going into the whole thing. Dijakovic, you step in. We'll still have our surprise guy. By the way, this is pretty much lumping in our War Games talk. So, I mean, we might as well talk about that at the same time. But it's Riddle and Balor. And then on the war game side of things, Ciampa, Dijakovic, Keith Lee, and Blank against the Undisputed Era. So don't you worry about Blank. Let me worry about Blank. Uh, I, I think that this pretty much rules out the idea that uh, this epic surprise member is not going to be Isaiah Swerve Scott or Cameron Grimes or any of the other people like that, though, right? Unless they're just really trying to mess with us and try and make us... Like I mean, what a swerve, am I right? <laughs> I will be pissed and happy at the same time if they do. Oh that. my god, it's Russo. Russo's gonna be the fourth member of the team. <laughs> well, he does have War Games experience. Mm. The big epic surprise I, I, I is that it's gonna be the match maybe, beyond. Book T then. Book T has plenty of uh, War Games experience. It's David Arquette, and that's why they brought him on backstage yeah. just to hype him up. Uh, Balor beats Riddle. He We're on agreement, do, yeah. right? Yeah, I'm really looking forward to that match. I'm not. I think... hmm? I'm not, not really. No, I got a feeling that it's gonna underwhelm. I've I've not seen anything from Matt Riddle which makes me believe that any match that he's part of will underwhelm. And Balor's now got. He seems to be motivated again now that he's not part of the main roster circus. So, that's uh, I I'm think that it's gonna be. Probably actually, even though the other two matches are going to be full of crazy spots and like weapons and more oh my god moments, I think this will be the best match on the show. The Riddle and Valor one? Yep. Where are you feeling about this, Bob? Um, Bob. <laughs> Bobby. Um... Bobby, what are you thinking, Bobby? Bobby? Oh my god, I said Bob, yeah. <laughs> I'm <laughs> looking at Valor and I just mixed that with Rob. Well, it works. Rowler um... and Bob. I think it'll be a good match. It's not anywhere near the caliber of what would have been for Gargano and Balor. Uh, Matt Riddle's going to have to eat an L before going to defend the brand for Survivor Series, which sucks, but I don't know. I It should be good. You know, I don't think anything on this match or on this card will be bad because they never are, but this should be really fun. Callum's very positive about it. Bobby D. Felice is very <laughs> positive about it. I think there's potential, but I also feel like if I get too much into the idea that this is 
oh, Riddle's good and Balor's good, so they're going to do a good thing. I think I'm going to be disappointed, so I'd rather be proven wrong. The War Games match for the men's side of the things, though, I can't but help but to be, like, hyped about it because the Undisputed Era is great, Chomp is great, Dijakovic's great, Keith Lee's great, and we got a surprise, quote-unquote, again, epic thing that's going to happen. Well, the epic thing could be massively disappointing, or it could be like, holy shit, this is, you know, fantastic. So, yeah, I'm I'm hyped about that more than any match on this card, and I'm leaning more towards the idea that the Undisputed Era team wins, but that surprise person could really sway me. Listen, last year, the War Games match finished, we did the podcast, and I went back and watched the match three times. I love the Undisputed Era when they're all together. I love War Games. This will probably be my favorite match of the year in terms of just sheer chaos. I think these matches are built for the heels to lose. So Team Ciampa wins, and Ciampa gets one step closer to getting Goldie back. Yeah, I feel pretty uh, convinced that Team Ciampa is going to win just because he needs to get one over on the Undisputed Era and Adam Cole in order to get a title shot down the line. I think that based on the other two members in this match, they could, Keith Lee and Dominic Dijakovic, could easily be positioned to fight for the tag team titles down the line. Yep. As like these two ah. people that used to be rivals fighting for the tag team championships down it'll the road. Be, it'll be a damn good match in whatever city the Royal Rumble is held in or wherever held in the next takeover is, but that'll be a fun match. And whoever the surprise is can go for Roderick Strong. Yeah, or they can pivot over to, like, Velveteen Dream when he comes back or move Matt Riddle into that bracket for a little while or some or some or something else. But, yeah, I'm, I can't say that I'm as excited because when I went back and watched the War Games match from last year, it's obviously fun and it's chaotic, but it's also completely, like, I would Not say unstructured. Sense. But but it's just it's just too much. It just feels like it's do it's trying to be everything, when it should just try and concentrate on being its own being its own entity and telling a story as opposed to okay I'm gonna go in I'm gonna hit you with this and I'm gonna hit you with that as opposed to just it, what it is which is just eight guys in the ring hitting each other with weapons and doing cool high spots but if you're into that sort of thing then that's pro- it probably will be the match of the night because i meant it, i imagine there's there's even more i would say even more talent but there's definitely a huge amount of talent in this match and it will excite it, it definitely proved to be an exciting spectacle if nothing else so actually now that like we did this whole discussion the fact that the Ciampa title victory thing is something to work towards. That Dijakovic and Lee tag team thing, I didn't think about that, and that's uh, that's standing out as something that they could definitely do. And then that mystery person, yeah, I mean, it pretty much has to be Team Ciampa that wins. Yeah, and I think Lee and Dijakovic teamed together quite a lot on the independent circuit after their kind of like matches that they had in various uh, promotions, so they're familiar teaming together. So, and they work really well together in the ring. Yeah, so and well, I think all these people, team. yeah, all these people seem to work very well together. And I'm interested to see what Fish and O'Reilly do in this situation as well, because of like how mu- how many different tag team combination moves can they do in one match? So the mystery person in Cara, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's Jordan Miles, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine that! Oh my god, that would be hilarious. If that was it's epic, all right. And he comes out wearing the shirt. And it's just oh, like, oh, you know, it's a whole been like this big storyline and whatever. And then it's just like, wow, you are really grasping at straws here <laughs> to try to get people to walk, watch the movie <laughs> material. Uh, we have one more match. It's another War Games match. Before we get into that, though, I want to throw out a couple plugs here. Obviously, we are doing quite a bit of podcasts this week. But if you want to make sure that we do more next week, because I'm going to try to take a little bit of a break and not do a 100 different podcasts, uh, then hit up the Patreon. Uh, it's the best way to motivate 
towards uh, doing specific things, and that's the in particular the pick your poison tier, where you can request some kind of a special feature that you would like us to do directly, and not kind of keep it vague and be like, well, I hope that they get around to doing this or something like that. So, if you want us to do anything related to Survivor Series type stuff, where you got something completely random uh, off the top of your head that you'd like to see us do consider donating to that tier. And if you don't have all the money to do that and you just want to help out in any way you can, even donating a buck can make a big difference. Same thing goes for the merchandise shops on TeePublic and Redbubble. That is where you can pick up some t-shirts and some different things like that on the Smart Out Moments side of things. And that obviously helps fund the channel and the website. And the same thing goes to Fanboys Anonymous and A Mango Tees. If you don't know what Fanboys Anonymous is, just check out fanboysanonymous.com and you'll figure it out. Check out my uh, Irishman review and some other things that are happening over there. So that's plugs out of the way. Let's get to the final match here, the women's war games match. And this one, we do know all the participants. Hold on, Callum, you're British. Can you say war games like uh, Regal? Uh, I don't have his sort of accent, unfortunately. Damn. He's got a, um, a very more... Well, much more regal accent, funny enough. So, go like war games. That, that's as best I could probably pull it off. <laughs> it's war games. You war games, bruv. Get, get in the cage. <laughs> Bat it out with everyone. It's going to be a right old ding dong. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm sold. <laughs> that's, why, uh... that's, why, that's why wrestling was so popular in the British. It's that sort of, uh, that sort of uh, promotion. Really, really sells it. Are you taking a piss? <laughs> uh, we have Team Rhea Ripley, which is Rhea Ripley, obviously. Candice LeRae, Tegan Knox, and Mia Yim against Team Shayna Baszler, which does not include Marina Shafir and Jasmine Duke. Instead, it has Bianca Belair, Io Shirai, and Kaylee Ray. So the first thing I want to talk about here is the people that aren't in the match. Duke and Shafir, they're on the outside, and the justification for Baszler was... I want them on the outside. Okay. Because you need uh, friends on the inside and the outside. I thought it was fine. It's much better than ignoring the fact that you don't want them in there because they're not ready. And the fact that me. they're not as big stars as Belair and Shirai. Yeah. And it'd be weird to, to do like Belair, Shirai, and Duke. And be like, well, why is Shafir not in there or something like that? Uh, but Kaylee Ray's in there, uh, NXT UK Women's Champion. Came out of nowhere, huh? And on the babyface side of things, there's two people that there's actually kind of three people that would potentially make sense based off of the other people, and that's Dakota Kai, Tony Storm, and Piper Niven. Now, Piper Niven and Tony Storm, they have a whole thing going on with Kaylee Ray that's gonna be airing over the next couple of weeks that will lead to NXT UK takeover Blackpool 2. Spoiler alert when it comes to that. Uh, Kaylee Ray versus Tony Storm versus Piper Niven is happening. So we know that they're heading in that direction and stuff, which means that there could be something that they do that kind of like alludes to that here. But at the very least, we know that Tony Storm has her history with Kaylee Ray. And there, there's part of me that just goes, well, shit, if you've got Storm and Dakota Kai sitting on the outside that they don't like this heel team, and you've got Duke and Shafir sitting on the heel team, and they could be potentially a part of this. Maybe it would have been a little bit more interesting if it would have been six on six. At the very least, I feel like Duke and Shafir have to do something on the outside, and maybe Dakota Kai and Tony Storm or somebody else helps balance out the equation. But I feel like six on six would have been a little bit more interesting. And I know that that's not the war game's setup, but who fucking cares? You know? Well, it would have been utter chaos. Yeah, that's fine. With, but, yeah, well, there, there's a limit to like the amount of utter chaos I'm willing to take, really. Just uh, the idea of having 12 people inside two rings with a well, cage surrounding them and covered in weapons and stuff like that. It's just it's too much. Well, tomorrow, tomorrow night you're going to have 15 and that's too in much. one ring. <laughs> yeah, that's going to be crazy. I don't know how they're going to do all that. But it yeah, would also like, mean that there'd be less uh, Kaylee Ray. And I'm a big fan Duke of Katie Ray. I know you don't like her, but Katie Ray will be great in this match. Yeah, She's sure fine. She it's just she came out of nowhere. Like, well, I I told you guys that I thought Katie Ray would be the fourth person on this team. 
At least I think I did. In my head, I did. But good for so... you to have the foresight. It's just like with all of the women that were already there and fighting, it seems odd that they're just like, and here's this outsider. Well, who well, else would they would have put on there? Like Vanessa Bourne? Tynara. That wouldn't have worked. Yeah, Tynara well, would have been they... like, blah. I think when the initial brawl went down, the idea was, okay, so we're just going to get, like Tony was saying, we'll do like some kind of a six on six. I think it works out. It's it's just a little bit out of left field just because it is an NXT UK competitor. But I feel like, I mean, realistically, the team that Shayna is feuding with, or not, just that who she's teaming with, are two people that she's recently feuded with in the past year over the NXT Women's Championship. Yeah. So they're not exactly best buds, but she's trying to create a dream team to like look after her and make sure that she wins this match. So it's really not about if Shayna Baszler is particularly close to these people or is particularly like fond of them. It's about just trying to assemble the best possible team that she could to beat Rhea Ripley's team. So For I think Kelly matter- fits the mold as a champion. For that matter, the idea that she was just feuding with Belair and Shirai and all that. I know a lot of people were saying, like, what if Dakota Kai is the fourth? And I was like, that would have been so stupid. It would have made no sense at all. But it, it would have made sense in the in the way that she was the one who was left out, like the main one that was left out of uh, Rhea Ripley's team. Basically told, you don't make the cup, you cut, you don't measure up. I've got these people. It's the fact that her tag team partner is in the match and sh- she isn't. So maybe it would be through resentment or rejection would lead her to like side with Shayna Baszler instead. And I could easily see the finish of the match being something where it looks like Duke and Shafir on the outside are going to get involved. Kai comes out and looks like that she's about to stop them, but she gets involved as well and takes out the Babyface's team to let Baszler's team win. I, I wouldn't I, be surprised they went that hill turn roll. I think that team Baszler wins. And the more that we talked about the men's match, I had originally had down that uh that the Undisputed Era would win and that team Babyface would win here, but I think it's actually flipped. I think that they want to make sure that Baszler looks strong because Baszler hasn't lost like pretty much anything. If you look at her win loss records and stuff, like she's lost a couple tag team matches here and there and stuff, but it's mostly been that she's been tagging with somebody and that person gets pinned on like a live event. Kyrie Sane's the only one that really has beaten Shayna Baszler. Everybody else, they either win by DQ or and it could happen here. It's not an elimination match, so they could pin like Io Shirai or something like that. But I think that it's a little easy. Nah. Not a little easy. It's a little hard. It's a better way to to put it. The opposite. It's hard to have Baszler's team lose and to not make it seem like, all right, well, what's the likelihood that she's going to win at Survivor Series? If she beats this team, though, and she's the one standing tall tall at the end of it, then going into Survivor Series the next night, it's like, well, Shayna Baszler, you know, she led her team to victory at War Games. And that also, if she doesn't win at, at Survivor Series... Well, she won at War Games. She just had a hell of a match, and that's why she didn't pull it off, and that's why Becky made Bailey tap or whatever. Yeah, those all those points make sense. I feel like, even though it could kind of go either way, because again, on the babyface side of things, it's likely that they're positioning Rhea Ripley to be the next challenger for the women's championship. Yeah. So it makes sense for them to win in order to like, build up that rivalry for the next takeover or for an episode of NXT coming up. But maybe maybe they want to in the immediate like see a bit more short term and like you say, having Baszler lead her team to victory sets her up well to be seen on an equal footing with ba- uh, Becky Lynch and Bailey in case other people weren't like viewing her in that role. So yeah. At the very yeah. least, if Team Baszler loses, Baszler's not getting pinned. No. And I, it is a good match to protect her. Um, I think she's actually one of the strongest built, if not the strongest built NXT star going into Survivor Series. So I think Rhea does win. 
again, to set up future championship matches. But I think Rhea beats Shirai. Because, spoiler, I think Shirai might be the one female who's not in Survivor Series. Well, we will talk about that, too. That'll be the last topic that we talk about. But, um... no, you know what? We'll I'll put a pen in that for right now. Just, um... You're so you're going Team Ripley. I'm going Ripley. And Callum, you're going Team Ripley or are you going Team Baszler? I think I'll go with Team Baszler. You've convinced me with your argument, it makes the most sense and NXT is a place where things do kind of make sense most of the time. And I'm going Team Baszler too, but if we're talking about the future of the championship and where they go from here, Shayna Baszler She's already beaten Candice LeRae. She's already beaten Mia Yim. She's already beaten Tegan Knox, right? Well, not no, not a singles yeah. match. They haven't built Knox up for a singles match yet. And she's beaten oh, everybody yeah. on her team. So uh... Kaylee Kaylee Ray beat Knox. That's I'm um, getting confused about that. Uh, she's beaten Dakota Kai, and she has beaten Bianca Belair, and she's beaten Io Shirai. She hasn't had a match with Kaylee Ray, but it's not like it matters. They're opposite brand champions. Rhea Ripley's the only one out of this whole match, other than the fact that the Tegan Knox thing hasn't happened yet. Rhea Ripley is the only one that hasn't had like a definitive loss against her. I think that that ended up like in a DQ or something, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like a no contest, some kind of brawl, bullshit, shenanigans. Yeah, I think it was like interference from Duke and Shafir that stopped it from going on. Yeah, so I would assume that whenever the next takeover is, which they haven't announced yet, it's it was supposed to originally be... NXT TakeOver Houston before the uh, Royal Rumble. But Boy, now it's the second there. time Houston got shafted. What was the first time? Well, there was supposed to be NXT TakeOver Houston, and then it got called uh, War Games. The last time? or The first uh, War Games was supposed to be NXT TakeOver Houston, and uh, they didn't get that uh, name. Uh, I'm assuming that when they do that, if that'll be February or something like that, or maybe even right around the Royal Rumble anyway, then that'll probably be when they do Rhea Ripley versus uh, Shayna Baszler. And they might get away with having that match happen, even if Team Ripley loses, just for the fact that if Ripley doesn't get pinned or made to submit, then maybe it's like, yeah, the feud just keeps continuing. They record some more crap over the next couple of weeks and a couple of months, and they lead to it that way. Oh yeah, I, I don't think as long as Ripley isn't, isn't the one who gets pinned, then right. it doesn't. I don't think it would have too much bearing if her team was to lose it, especially if it did involve like if it did come about due to interference from either Duke Fear or if Dakota Kai was to turn heel. And I got a feeling if Dakota Kai were to turn heel, which I don't think is happening, then Tegan Knox is the one that gets pinned. Yeah, she would attack Tegan Knox, and that'll probably be the feud going forward between those two, at least for at least in the short term. Yeah. Uh, the last thing that we need to talk about, though, is the idea of this whole, like, Team Survivor Series stuff. And we should, at the very least, it, it'll be freaking annoying if we don't, we should know who these teams are by the end of tonight, at the end of this episode of NXT. If they don't announce that, they're either doing it because they, for some reason, think that having this, like, whoa, what's going to happen is going to convince people that it's more interesting or they really don't know what they're doing and they're just waiting until the last minute. And I hate it when WWE does that because then it's like, how do we believe in you? But we need five for the men, five for the women. In any circumstances, whether they announce it in advance or not, these War Games teams have to be teaming up with people that are on the opposite teams. I highly doubt that they're going to be like, all right, well, Team NXT for the women is the four members of the babyface team, Maria Ripley and Dakota Kai. Be like, wait, what? You're just going to lose uh, Bianca Belair and Io Shirai? That doesn't make any sense. Or that the, I mean, they can't do that with the Undisputed Era team because they're all fighting for the title matches. And it would be weird if it was like, all right, Team NXT for the men is Ciampa, Dijakovic, Lee, Riddle, and whoever that other guy is it could happen but where's Balor then you know so our last predictions heading into this who's going to be on the women's team Rhea Ripley Tegan Knox, 
Mia Yim, Dakota Kai, Bianca Belair. I would go with Canister Ray, Rhea Ripley, Io Shirai, Bianca Belair, and Mia Yim. That's the exact crew that I'm going with. I feel like uh, Tegan Knox and Dakota Kai kind of sit this one out a little bit. And for the men's side, they could always bring in people from NXT UK for any of this stuff too. Like they could bring Tony Storm in for NXT on the team or, you know, I don't think that they're going to though. Um, I'll say my team that I think is going to happen for team NXT. I think that for the men's team, it's going to be Ciampa, uh, Dijakovic, Lee, Balor, and Riddle. I agree with most of your list except Balor because he hasn't appeared a single time in defense of them. And I think we get one of the individuals that loses the triple threat. And I'll go with Damian Priest. Well, that's only if they don't announce it tonight. Because they can't announce like Damian Priest and then be like, he's on Team NXT. Also, he has a match at TakeOver, and if he does that, he fights Adam Cole. I don't think that they're going to do that. Which is, unfortunately, more ammo for them not announcing anything. Uh, I kind of agree with Tony's lineup. I think if you if you don't have Balor on the team, you're really missing a trick, really. Are the... you surprised that they haven't had him in the build-up to this? Well, he's he's kind of... I don't think he's coming as like an outsider, but he's just coming to do his own thing. Which I guess, like, if you wanted to go ahead with that story, could, like, eliminate him from being part of this because he's essentially come back to NXT to be his own man and he doesn't agree with how NXT's quote-unquote gotten soft. But I kind of think that's going to be overridden by the fact that they just want to make this these matches big and Bala makes it bigger. So I, I just don't feel like there's anybody else realistically that, like Priest is good, and you could do stuff with maybe Killian Dane, or you could put Bronson Reed or Isaiah Scott on these on these teams. But I feel like if you're missing Velveteen Dream, if he's not available, if Johnny Gargano is not available, if uh, Kashid is not available, then there's really no other five people than those five to really kind of level the playing field with the other teams that are there. We were talking the idea of this whole battle royal concept, and I feel like that can't really apply to the men's war games match because that would, I mean, they also said that, you know, this big surprise is going to happen and stuff, but it would be weird to be like, you know, the winner of this battle royal gets to have a feud against the Undisputed Era, sort of, but they could do that for Team NXT. They could say the winner of this thing is going to be able to represent NXT, and that could be a way to put somebody like Isaiah Swerve Scott into the match. Mm. Be like, we'll give him a win, make him seem like he's more important. Or they could we'll put uh, Leah Rush in there too and just say, he's Cruiserweight champion. Put him on there. Well, if it's, if it's, or they could put Walter on it. Yeah, they could have Walter. Yeah, I didn't think about that really. I mean, I, and also, if it, if it would be a battle royal to determine who it would be, then it's obviously going to be Mansoor. Because <laughs> <laughs> Mansoor specializes in battle royals and he has beaten people on the main roster. If that's the case and they don't have Ciampa, Lee, Dijakovic, Riddle, and Balor, I think that Balor is the one that sits this out. And they either do that Battle Royal type thing, they go with somebody like Swerve, or maybe they do end up doing that Triple H thing. Uh, I don't think that's going to happen, though. I think it's going to be Balor. And if they want to get around the whole, like, why would Balor be doing this for NXT? Shit, maybe their plan is Balor immediately just walks out of the match. Like, they tag him in and he just goes, nah, fuck this, I don't want to fight for NXT. And that could be a way to get a quick elimination. But they but then, then that sucks, because you know? then you're like, well, you could have showcased somebody else instead of saying, here's Balor, okay, he's gone. Yeah, but their argument would be, we advertised that he was there and he was there. We got everybody to pay attention with Balor. And we are showcasing him because, oh, isn't he such a heel, that bastard? Well, I, I'm kind of more agreeable to those sort of things as long as it's 
trying to tell an actual a story alongside it as opposed to they just I don't know if Balor was injured but they pretended that he wasn't and then he just decides to walk out of the match because of that I don't feel like it's falsely advertising in that regard well I think the justification would be what he had said in his promo yeah like yeah you know the NXT's gone soft and what is this place and all that so if they said like yeah, the next week on NXT, we're going to find out why he left and why he couldn't fight for NXT. And then he just goes, I fucking told you like this, these, uh, this NXT crew is not the crew that it was with me. And but yeah, why would I have brand supremacy over something that sucks? And like, they can do that. And then somebody else comes out and they're like, Hey, fuck you, pal. We, we are NXT. And then, you know, they start a new feud with Balor and uh, who the fuck knows? Jackson Riker. <laughs> Highly doubt it. But I do uh, think Ciampa, Lee, and Dijakovic, and probably Riddle, too, are, like, four guarantees for that. And then it's just a matter of who's the fifth guy. Is it Balor? Is it somebody like Swerve? Is it somebody like Triple H? Is it... They can't announce the epic uh, guy that's unknown for the War Games thing and be like, oh, he's the fifth member or something like that. And if they say that it's, like, Ciampa, Lee, Dijakovic, Riddle, and blank the same as it is for the War Games match, it'll be like, oh, okay, then it's probably that guy for both. Mm. Yeah, that, that, that thing, that pretty much uh, is all we can predict so far until we get more information, hopefully on NXT. Until, like, later on tonight, it'll be revealed Shawn Michaels is defending NXT <laughs> against... Uh... They're bringing a uh, train out of retirement. <laughs> no, they're bringing Tensai. <laughs> 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 you never saw uh, uh, sweet coming. tea. I think you'll find is uh, how he ended his run. What was the dude? That, I don't know why this name popped into my mind, but like Oliver something. He was a part of NXT before NXT. Oh, got the, really the one who was originally bride. champion. Yeah, he was, was the, he yeah, like the inaugural tag- champion. He was um no, he wasn't the inaugural champion, but he beat I think uh, him and uh, mm, Neville. Neville. Yeah, they were they were tag team champions. I don't know if they were the first tag team champions, but they're definitely one of the first. Too. They, they might have been the first ones because I know off like I think they lost it to the Wyatt family and then and then uh Oliver Gray got injured and was pretty much never heard from again <laughs> and uh, Neville switched to having Corey Graves as his tag team partner. He went up the stairs and was never heard from again. Yeah, it was uh British yeah, Oliver, ambition. Oliver, Oliver and Gray. And they beat the Wyatt family, in fact. That would be an epic he, surprise. He goes Who is- by Joel Redman. And he's wrestling on um, Frontier Wrestling Alliance in the UK. Yeah. So, oh, not. Uh, oh, is, is, well, I, thought, is, I don't know. Is that one of the ones that's uh, been, uh, like wiped off face the earth? Uh, very uh, likely. Yeah, because of because you know, I mean, Pete Dunn, Pete Dunn never lied to us about how uh, NXT UK would kill the entire British wrestling independence. <laughs> this is the weirdest. I'm looking at the inaugural tag tournament. Very weird. Who was in it? Um, we got the Wyatt family who beat Percy Watson and Yoshitatsu. Wow, in the that's quarter a tag team. What the hell? <laughs> Way before anything, Bo Dallas and Michael McGillicuddy defeated Primo and Epico. Hmm. And you got British Ambition, uh, Neville and Oliver Gray defeated Drew McIntyre and Heath Slater. And the final two teams were Cassius Ono and Leo Kruger against Alex Riley and Derek Bateman. Huh. This is how far NXT has come. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, we will get more information about this later on, a couple hours from now. Of course, by the time I edit this and upload it, it's probably going to be around the time that NXT is starting, and we're going to be out of date. But you know, we'll address it tomorrow on the Survivor Series talk, and then of course after that, they're going to change things around on SmackDown, and then Survivor Series will be out of date. And then you know, but we'll we'll do what we can. That's what happens when they switch the whole thing around and it's not Tuesdays anymore. Um, We will be doing that, obviously, tomorrow, as I just said. That'll be the Survivor Series talk, so we will reference that stuff. And then later on in this week, when we actually have TakeOver, which will be Saturday night, I'll be doing the live coverage on the website. And then we'll be doing our post-show, as we normally do. And the same thing will happen for Survivor Series. So that'll happen on Sunday, and you know those are your next three podcasts that are going to be coming. I'll tell you about what's happening next week when we get back around here, but I want to give these guys a chance to plug some stuff as well. So, Callum? 
Well, my main plug, as it always is, is 2001 A Wrestling Odyssey, our retro podcast where me and Rob go back to the year 2001, check out all of the events and the news and everything else that was taking place back in the year that wrestling changed forever, where WWF took control of everything and has never looked back since. And this month for November, we'll be looking at Survivor Series 2001, which is the epic Team WWF against Team Alliance, end of that entire feud and storyline, as well as a little look at Rebellion 2001 and the XWF and any other news that we find interesting from that time. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Wigmeister14 and check out the Power Rankings and all the other weekly articles on smartcatmoment.com. And you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at DudePolice. Check out everything going on at Smartout Moment. Check out everything going on at Fanboys. Check out WrestleZone.com and the WrestleZone Daily, which I take part in Monday through Thursday. Check out E-Wrestling News and Fightful.com. There is an amazing feature all about the legend of Soul Train Jones up right now at Fightful.com, and it needs to be heard and seen to believe. So check that out. Back to Tony. So we will be doing all these kind of things the way that we normally do. And what are we going to do next week? Well, we're going to do the mailbag for November. Yay. So send in those questions if you haven't already. We already got a couple from some people here and there. Howard, for instance, has a, a marry, fuck, kill for us that we're going to do next week. Some different things like that. So it doesn't have to be wrestling related, but that's obviously the main point of this whole channel. So if it is a wrestling question, awesome. If it's not, that's cool, too. Send in those mailbag questions, and we'll get around to answering as many of them as we can. There is a tier on the Patreon that makes sure that we will answer any of the questions that you submit as long as you donate to that tier, As and also if it's not something that's, like, horribly, uh, you know, personal or something like that. It's not going to be like, so what's your login information for this uh, bank account? Or something? We're not going to answer that kind of question, but um, if you want to make sure that we answer all your questions, donate to the tier for that. And if you just want to toss as many questions as you can think of, and I'll whittle them down and we'll answer as many as we can when we go around to doing that. We're also going to be taking care of our predictions for Starcade because that's happening on December 1st. So that'll be sometime around next week. I don't know exactly when we're going to do that stuff. We also have the Champs Giving tournament going on right now. We are on round four, the semifinals. And I believe that the current lineup is Rob Van Dam versus Jeff Hardy and Bubba Ray Dudley against The Undertaker. Oddly enough, Crash Ali didn't get into this, but better that's, than uh, better than the first Thanksgiving. Eh, we'll debate about it. Uh, <laughs> we will break that all down the week after next when we are doing the whole review of the whole thing, and we've already had you know all that stuff happening. Uh, next week is Thanksgiving. So that's going to change the way that we do some of this stuff as well. So I don't know exactly what our recording schedule is going to be, but it doesn't make a whole lot of sense for us to be like, oh, we're going to record on Thursday on Thanksgiving. We'll figure it out. We'll get around it when we can. And you guys will be aware of when we post those things, when we have things up on the website and on the social media accounts. And if you do the whole like ringing the bell on the YouTube channel, then you'll get the email alerts for the different things that get posted. And that's the best way to be aware of all that stuff. So we will do all that stuff when we can. In the meantime, we have the rest of the pay-per-view point stuff. So that's going to be next is Survivor Series talk. Just check out everything that's happening on smartcomoment.com and all the other stuff under a mango tree. And we will see you next time. Thank you for listening to this, everybody. This has been another Smart Out moment and we're being counted out. Ah!